All right, guys, welcome to the show and happy Wednesday. We got a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the world. A lot of people are saying 2024 is the year of exposure and they may damn well be right because a lot of people are getting exposed this year. We're gonna be talking about P. Diddy, Sean Combs, whatever it is you wanna call him, the fact that his house was recently raided and uh, the investigation is probably going to go through as far as all the sex trafficking allegations that have been placed against him. Plus, we got a ton of girls just being punched in the face in New York City. I don't know what's going on there. Also, uh, a bridge in in Baltimore collapsed after a ship collided with it. Now people are getting all conspiratorial about that. But one thing they're getting wrong is the accusation that DEI had something to do with it. But we're going to get into all that and more. Before we do, we got Taylor in Nashville. Hey, happy Wednesday. Did he do it? That is the question of the day, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like he done it. (laughs) (laughs) Did he did it? Okay, (laughs) let's just go ahead and put that out there. At least that's what I believe. Okay, don't send any shooters for me. I believe he did it (laughs) now. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly. No, we're going to get into all this P. Diddy stuff because you guys have probably been seeing his name all over the news. As I said, his house was raided recently by, I believe, the FBI and the DOJ who and, and they were looking for evidence. So they say in regard to this large sex trafficking trafficking ring that he uh, allegedly was running. They're calling him the Jeffrey Epstein of hip hop. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, I'm going to let somebody else break it down and give you all the major details. We can watch this together and sort of get our feet on the ground when it comes to this story. Federal agents raided the L.A. and Miami homes of billionaire hip hop mogul Sean Diddy Holmes. Homeland Security conducted the armed raid in an alleged sex trafficking operation. TMZ later capturing Diddy pacing around a private Miami airstrip. Diddy wasn't arrested, but his phones were seized. And there's speculation tonight that he's fled the country. We can't confirm it. Just breaking tonight, though, Diddy's attorney is putting out a statement saying, quote, there's no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities. This unprecedented ambush paired with advanced coordinated... Oh, we got a little glitch Media presence leads to a premature rush to judgment of Mr. Combs and is nothing more than a witch hunt. We believe the raid was triggered by a litany of lawsuits, including from his own ex, alleging abuse, rape, and sex trafficking. Did he settle that one? But then, two months ago, his former producer, Rodney Lil Rod Jones, filed an explosive lawsuit containing disturbingly graphic and disgusting details that not only implicate Diddy, but aim straight at the heart of the music industry. An elaborate racketeering blackmail and sex trafficking scheme that his lawyers compare to Jeffrey Epstein's. Yeah, I was going to say, does that at all sound familiar to you guys? Sort of racketeering blackmail scheme that involves the sex trafficking of minors. Are we at all shocked to hear that this news is happening within, you know, yet another elite industry here in our country? No, I'm starting to think you're not going to find an industry in this country where stuff like this isn't happening. Of course, we have the whole Jeffrey Epstein back and forth. uh, He who did not kill himself uh, that we've all been talking about for a very long time now. This, of course, comes on the heels of the conversations we've been having surrounding Nickelodeon and the quiet on set documentary that recently came out that involved, yes, the sexual assault of minors, uh, not just one many. So... Am I at all surprised to hear that this is also happening within the hip hop industry and that there may be a blackmail scheme involved with this? No, I am not. And interestingly enough, this is forcing me to go back in my memory to hear about, to think about other rappers who have spoken out about this. And you all know when Kanye was on his whole, what we were calling a a crazy rant, he was talking about all these different rappers and just coming out with these just bombastic statements. Statements. I'm going back and listening to a lot of this stuff and I'm like, you know, he's sounding kind of, <laughs> he's sounding correct because he was in an interview talking about P. Diddy and saying P. Diddy was a Fed and that he is working a- alongside the-, the Feds in some sort of major scheme. He did not state what that scheme was, but now that I'm looking back at it, blackmail, racketeering, you know, shuffling around of new elite people within the industry, blackmailing political figures and other elites is starting to make a little bit of sense. It's starting to make a little bit too much sense, uh, which will tell you 
you know, how things go when you start to make a little bit too much sense. Now, for over a year, Lil Rod had unfettered access to Diddy's world, his homes, his planes, and his parties, where he claims he witnessed mountains of narcotics, illegal firearms, laced drinks, sex workers, and underage boys and girls. The producer claims he was groped by Diddy, groomed, and forced into humiliating sexual performances. Diddy's chief of staff, Christina Corum, is said to have been the Ghislaine Maxwell to Sean Combs, allegedly ordering her assistance to keep Mr. Combs high off gummies, pills, cocaine, and ecstasy, and maintaining a steady stream of sex workers for her boss. Now, some of the women brought into Diddy's orbit were under the age of 16. <clears throat> That's according to the complaint. The lawsuit claims he required the sex workers and underage girls to sign NDAs prior to entering his parties and prior to being drugged and sex trafficked at these parties. Diddy allegedly forced all of the women to drink laced de Leon liquor, as well as laced Chirac vodka and champagne. His former bodyguard, Gene Deal, said this. And there's a little bit of, like, you know, speculation on whether or not it was the liquor or was it the juice that they were mixing in the liquor. I think they might even clear it up right now so we can listen to that. Guys don't put those pills that they get to the girls in the champagne bottles because they popping them in front of them. It's in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. They didn't put the pills and the stuff in there, the roofies. Those girls who like the mixed drinks, they gonna pull their own sexual act because they don't understand it ain't in the bottles, it's in the juice. Those guys, they learn that and they put it to those girls who don't know no better. Now, Diddy called these his freak out parties. In attendance were celebrities, politicians, athletes, international dignitaries like British royalty, Prince Harry, and music label executives. Lil Rod claimed some of the biggest names in the recording industry sponsored these parties with sex workers, drugs, and underage girls. And ask yourself this, okay, are we gonna get, just like with the Epstein situation, a whole nother rollout where Sean Combs takes the fall for everything and they launch this entire investigation and the feds go and raid his home, supposedly to get evidence, AKA probably clear out a bunch of stuff that implicates them, but who knows, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, we get this whole story, oh, P. Diddy, you know, he's this ringmaster when it comes to sex trafficking within Hollywood, and then he goes down for it, and then do we ever get the list of all the people who attended the parties? Do we get the footage of all the other celebrities, elites, politicians, who were also engaging with these young girls knowingly? Because when you go back and look at all these different interviews that different people in the industry have had regarding P. Diddy, it is made very clear that they know he is dangerous, that they know he's scheming and doing a lot of illegal activity, and that he's somebody that you either want to be in good graces with or completely stay away from. So if everybody within the industry knows this about P. Diddy, you know, who else is implicated in these allegations and in, in this lawsuit? And hopefully, there's going to be other people up on the chopping block, chopping block. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, and it might just be Jay-Z. Uh, so bear that in mind. We're going to get there in this conversation, but we got to unravel this a little bit more. Girls, the CEO of Universal Music, Lucian Grange, is named as a defendant. So is the former CEO of Motown Records, Ethiopia, Hubbard Merriam, and others. <laughs> Lil Rod says hidden cameras were in every room of Diddy's homes. Lil Rod believes that Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person that has attended his freak-off parties and his house parties. Salacious tapes of Hollywood's biggest names, including record CEOs and politicians, doing drugs and cavorting with prostitutes and minors. The complaint argues that these freak-off parties were a business model. Young and up-and-coming talent attended and were promised career opportunities and access to music executives. They were then plied with drugs and alcohol, filmed. Some were blackmailed. <clears throat> There was a quid pro quo, according to the complaint. Lil Rod said not only were these music executives sponsoring these parties, they were handing Diddy large sums of cash that he used to pay for the sex workers and drugs. Something tells me the IRS is going to be interested. The suit claims the defendants funded the sex trafficking venture and participated in the recruitment of victims. Now, if this is true, this is so bad. Famous artists like Usher, at the age of 13, were whisked away to Diddy's puffy flavor camp. 
I lived with mm-hmm. Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. You were 13. What were you I saying? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, and it was, <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't say that. Okay. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh-huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh-huh. Would you ever say? Yeah. What she should have asked was there a man who came along. Uh, and that man probably would have been P. Diddy, given the information that we now have about the sexual acts that he was engaging in with both men and women who are underage. I shouldn't even say men and women. I should say boys and girls. But we'll, we'll let them finish out this clip. Send your kid to puffy camp. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Hell no, Usher says, that he would not send his kid to Puffy Camp, a.k.a. Puff Daddy's Camp. And we're going to divert a little bit here and uh, talk about Usher, because interestingly enough, uh, many a young person in Hollywood and in the music industry has been around uh, Sean Diddy Combs, and Usher's name is murmured there, Justin Bieber's name is murmured there. Let's see these Justin Bieber clips uh, of, of him and P. Diddy, and you let me know if there's sort of an air of of discomfort with what you were watching. Everything's good, Everything's selling great. out arenas and everything. Yeah. Starting to act different, huh? You, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't, I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, biz, you know, partners and whatnot, mm-hmm. but. It, you never really got my number, so. Right, okay. My number? Yeah, yeah. Everything's good. Everything's good. So. Okay. A little uncomfortable. Obviously, I'm, I, I can't speak to anything that uh, Justin Bieber may have experienced at the hands of uh, Sean Diddy Combs. I, I don't want to speak to that. I don't want to speculate about it. But I just want to show you these clips that exist, knowing his history, his criminal history. Here's another one of him and Justin Bieber. And mind you, Justin Bieber was really close with uh, Usher. You guys know the whole, whole song, Somebody to Love, that was super popping when Justin Bieber was on the come up. That's him and Usher. Uh, here's a clip of, of them discussing. Discussing. Let's watch this. Justin, he's in. You ever seen the movie Forty Eight Hours? Right now, he's having Forty Eight Hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, 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 the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a fifteen year old's dream. Um, you know, I I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he yeah. signed to Usher. I'm signed to Usher. Uh, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, and, yeah, and, we, and we gonna go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. Justin, he's- I cringe uh, to think of what could have possibly been happening within those 48 hours that Justin Bieber was spending uh, with P. Diddy. But you can sort of hear there's almost innuendo being used in the way he's speaking about it. Of course, you can cover this up. Like, legally, there's nothing you can say there. They're saying, oh, we're going to go full. It's going to be a fun 48 hours. It's a 15-year-old's dream. I don't know what all that means, right? And Usher, throughout his career, is known as, like, this sex symbol. The women love Usher, all these different things, mind you. We just stated that he was in a close relationship with Shonda Combs when he was 13 years old. Now, I'm going to remind y'all, and I'm going to go back to some other drama that happened on the internet, uh, and we're creating a very, very tangled web in this, but just follow me, stick with me through it. Y'all remember when we covered on this show, or, or on my second channel, something something along those lines, Kiki Palmer, actress Kiki Palmer, many of you know her. If you don't, let me pull up a picture real quick so I can jog your memory. She is a famous actress. She does music, all that fun stuff. There's there's Kiki Palmer. I'll put her in full screen for those of you who want to see her. She went to an Usher concert in Vegas and she was wearing kind of a little skimpy outfit and she was dancing with Usher while he was singing the song My Boo and they were all up on each other and Kiki was married. And uh, her her man, Darius Jackson, who was a you know, football player, it doesn't matter. Her man, Darius Jackson, took to the internet and called her out for being scantily clad and dancing on Usher and said, you know, you're a mother because she's the the mother of his child. You shouldn't be out there dancing with Usher like that. And you certainly shouldn't be doing it dressed like that. And that was, you know, the word that he had to share about Kiki Palmer. And he shared this publicly. 
Everybody was calling out Kiki for being a 304. Other people were coming after Darius Jackson saying, you should never call out the mother of your child like this in public. You deal with this in private. None of that really matters. But in the wake of that, Kiki Palmer and Darius Jackson were on the rocks in their relationship. Kiki Palmer's mom sort of placed herself in the middle of their arguments as a mediator, specifically when it comes to this Usher conversation. And we got a recorded phone call between Kiki Palmer's mom and Darius Jackson, Kiki Palmer's man at the time. And Kiki Palmer's mom is going to say something really important here about Usher. So listen up. Talk about my daughter? You gonna harass my daughter? You gonna talk about Usher? Usher is gay. Armand you Williams. You and your stupid ass family don't even understand the business. Usher is gay, guys. Tell her to put some clothes on. So she said, you're going to come up here and harass my daughter, talk about my daughter. And she says, Usher is gay. You don't even understand the business. Usher is gay. Now, this is confirmed, recorded uh, phone call between the two of them, not to like air their laundry out, but this is all over the internet. How is it that Usher is gay? What could have happened at 13 years old between him and Sean Diddy Combs that would result in that sort of sexuality? Would you m imagine maybe some form of, of sexual abuse at the hands of a man? And interestingly enough, when he's talking about, you know, Puff Daddy's camp that he went to at 13 years old, he makes it very clear that there were sexual acts that he was engaging in. He doesn't make it clear who those sexual acts are with. And now we sort of know that this is uh, Sean Combs' whole thing or P. Diddy's whole thing, that he brings in up and coming rappers or popular people within the industry. He gets them to engage in homosexual acts, which we all know is very looked down upon within the black community. And then he blackmails them with the action that he had them commit at his house and at his party. And if you go through and listen to other people talk about P. Diddy, they're always throwing in sexual innuendos or the reason I don't hang out with P. Diddy is because he goes too hard or the reason I don't hang out at these parties is because I don't want to engage in, in gay sexual acts. So it seems very clear that, that, what he's, that that's what he's doing. Now, unfortunately, I think more people on the internet and specifically on black Twitter are focusing more on the fact that these were gay sexual acts and not on the fact that this is sex trafficking and that this is sexual assault of both minor boys and girls. I think that's far, a far more important thing to talk about than the fact that these are men engaging with other men. But of course, if you, you know, put out a story like this, all the gay jokes are going to start coming out and it unfortunately overshadows what is very illegal activity. But now he's getting raided by the FBI and the DOJ. We'll see, considering there's also allegations that he's a Fed. So all of these different departments and agencies could very well be in on what's happening right now. Now, we're going to go back to the breakdown here uh, and from, from Jesse Waters. Shout out to him for laying this all out for us. 15-year-old Justin Bieber spent days with Diddy. Right now, he's having 48 hours with Diddy, him and his boy, um... They're having the times of their lives, what we're doing, um, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, you know, I, I have been given custody of him, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. Crazy. I'm taking this out tonight. What you want to do? Let's just go get some girls. Let's go get some girls. A man after my heart, that's what I'm talking about, kid. And let me pause here and talk about Justin Bieber for just a little bit more. The thing that this kid endured within Hollywood and the music industry is astounding. And he endured it right in front of everybody's eyes. And it's no wonder that he's going through what he's going through right now in adulthood. It seems like he may be out on the other end of it now, that maybe he's sort of overcome drug addiction possibly. But we all know he went through a really tumultuous time in adulthood where, I don't know, he was buying monkeys and then what leaving them at the airport he was pissing in mop buckets and just like out in front of everybody and creating all these problems he was doing a lot of drugs he was partying he comes out to speak about things that he faced when he was young within the industry he was given drugs alcohol all this different stuff as a teenager just entering the music industry and lord knows what went on when he was hanging out with p diddy and going to all these different parties and getting accustomed to all the different elites who are moving chess pieces on the board uh, in hollywood and you just have to think yeah no wonder no wonder you did all this stuff in adulthood. No wonder you've had such a difficult time just growing up. Just being famous as a young person is a really difficult thing to, to go through. And then to have people 
using you in this way, possibly assaulting you in this way. Uh, it's just devastating. And as I said, many people did this right before our eyes. When Justin Bieber was 18, I believe he was at an award show where he went on stage with Jenny McCarthy, and you can look her up. This video exists out on the internet. This woman tries to kiss him right in front of everybody on stage televised, and he's clearly so uncomfortable trying to get away from her, and she continues to pursue the assault on him. It's just insane. So if that's happening on television for everybody to watch with this kid, what's happening behind closed doors? Never mind the fact that like at what, like 13, 15, he was like a global sex symbol without any of us acknowledging the fact that he is a, a minor. There's so much to be said about his trajectory and all the things that he went through and things we'll probably never know, but hopefully it gets unearthed. And we're not accusing Diddy of doing anything bad with Bieber, but Diddy's lifestyle was an open secret in the industry. People have been warning about this for years. Now, I've had to turn down $50 million four times. Four times. Just to protect my integrity and that virgin hole I was telling you about. <laughs> right. Because uh, P. Diddy be wanting to body. And you got to tell him no. Oh, you got to tell him no. I, I did. I did. See, I got the receipts for everything I'm telling you. Now, Diddy operated like he was protected. Mr. Combs made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Mohammed, had the power to make people and problems disappear. Fahim Mohammed, Diddy's head of security, was the former head of security for Michael Jackson, who was also accused of sexual deviancy. Diddy's head of security is accused of paying off law enforcement. The lawsuit claims Diddy bragged about getting away with shooting people. Diddy and his girlfriend at the time, JLo, weren't charged for that New York City nightclub shooting involving rapper Shine. Another shooting that Lil Rod alleges he saw was a shooting inside of Diddy's own studio that left blood in the restroom, where Diddy instructed Lil Rod to lie to the police by telling them that the victim was shot standing outside the studio by a drive-by assailant. The lawsuit has photos of this stuff. And after hours of forensics and police inside the room, no charges. Lil Rod claims he saw Diddy distribute guns from his bedroom closet to questionable individuals dressed in all black. Diddy alluded to having law enforcement in his back pocket. Lil Rod said the defendants bragged about murdering people and bribing witnesses and jurors. Inside of Diddy's mind, the lawsuit says he believes he's above the law and is untouchable. But it looks like Diddy's world's collapsing. Now, what we don't know is how many people he'll take with him and whether we'll ever see the evidence the feds seized from his homes. All of these uh, big deviants is all catching hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you did here or whoever you is. All lies will be exposed. That's all. In 30 years, I've done nothing but collect information, knowledge, and your secrets. So if you and a man was in a corner doing something you wasn't supposed to be doing, I know so many things I shouldn't know. It. Dude, you know the world is getting crazy when Cat Williams is on Fox News. <laughs> That's all I gotta <laughs> say. When they're playing Shannon Sharp and Cat Williams on Fox News and talking about P. Diddy, something is, something is awry, something is afoot. I don't know what's going on. And how Cat Williams would have called that 2024 would be the year that things were going to be exposed, I don't know. But he says, he's like Littlefinger in Game of Thrones. He's got a million people who are just whispering in his ear apparently about everything that's going on so maybe he knew something was gonna happen I do know uh, that we Cassie's lawsuit against P Diddy must have been some sort of catalyst because this went out it went all over and I think of, uh, many had other things to say and of course they settled that out of court but I think hers was a catalyst so I mean shout out to her for being brave enough to stand up against what it could be just a multi-tiered racketeering blackmail ring uh, that involves so many victims, so many perpetrators, uh, possible, you know, buying off of law enforcement, possible, you know, feds and all this different stuff. Uh, a very brave, brave woman. And they all know it. They all know it. Sex trafficking advocate Yako Bullions joins us now. Yako, your sister was trafficked in the music industry. What does this story tell you now? Jesse, thank you for having me on. Yes, my sister Ilanka, her story of trafficking started in the music industry. She was trafficked over a six-year period by a record label executive. The industry is rife with this. There's a lot of cover-up because people are, as you so eloquently state, surreptitiously filmed. They are blackmailed. Remember, human trafficking's definition is the exploitation of persons through the mechanism of forced fraud and coercion 
all of them present in this case. And why would you not do that? I mean, it makes total sense, right? If you've got an up and coming artist who you know is going to make you millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, why not, you know, just get them liquored up or drugged up at a party, get them to engage in something illegal, and then boom, you have a guardianship or whatever it is that uh, Sean Diddy Combs stated he had over uh, Usher. Or you get them signed to your label, you have somebody that you can control, you have somebody that you can manipulate, and you can do this across every sphere of influence within our society. So it, it makes sense that this is happening all across the board. And again, you know, I, I want to feel like, yay, what a big moment. Uh, Diddy Combs has been he's been sort of exposed and the, the FBI is doing something about it. The DOJ is doing something about it. But it makes you think like, you know, uh, is this just going to be a fall guy for what's a much larger issue? And we're never going to get actually to the base of the problem. We're never going to actually find out all of the people who were involved who should be held to account here. Now, this whole P. Diddy drama is bringing up Jay-Z. I'm seeing Jay-Z's name a lot. He has a very close relationship with P. Diddy. He's on his website. He goes to P. Diddy's parties. It's P. Diddy's birthday. They have a ton of videos together out on the internet. And it's pretty well known that uh, Jay-Z has engaged with minors. Uh, I believe, I want to... Uh, remember her name properly, but he had a girlfriend named Foxy, who I believe was 15 years old at the time that uh, Jay-Z uh, was with her, and he was in his late 20s. So already there, you have uh, illegal activity. Some people have speculated that he was also involved with Aaliyah. You had Wendy Williams on the Wendy Williams show talk about everybody knows that uh, Jay-Z was was with that young woman uh and she didn't give the age of that woman i think on the show but 15 years old is the age and if you're hanging out with p diddy and you guys are close close buddy buddy i can't imagine you weren't involved with all the other stuff that he had going on and you had no idea what was going on there now how deep his involvement goes and whether or not he has some sort of position of leadership i don't i don't know i i can't accuse him of being involved in such things but it does seem to be general knowledge with everybody who's well acquainted with Jay-Z that he engaged in that sort of impropriety and illegal action of being with a minor. Now, how many more he engaged with? I don't know. Maybe none. But I think one is enough. And it's sort of setting a, a standard and a pattern here within the hip hop industry. And interestingly enough, the people who are willing to speak out against it and to say, hey, you know, this is going on or even just like give you a little a little nod, a little tilt to the fact that this is going on. Oh, they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Cat Williams was called crazy. Uh, Kanye West was called crazy. And Kanye West has called out both P. Diddy and Jay-Z. Kanye said that P. Diddy is a fed. And he said that Jay-Z has, you know, killers out there. He has shooters out there uh, that could come for your head if he wanted them to do exactly that. So it seems like crazy is not looking so crazy anymore. And we'll show you footage of... Uh, the, the raid that happened, uh, uh, two of, of P. Diddy's places, I think one in Los Angeles and one in Miami. You can check that out here. Holmes, the rapper and music executive, perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. He got some shots of a few people coming out of the home. Those people have been detained. Now we're trying to still connect the dots. We do have some sources on scene here that we're getting this information from. We were actually the first ones here with about 30 different law enforcement vehicles at least. There are three Bearcats on scene here. This just all unfolded, Sandra, I would say less than 10 minutes ago. We got here even before the crime scene tape came up. So uh, we're just down the hill. If you look up this street where Tony is right now to the right, you'll see one of those Bearcats and law enforcement. And on the other side of those bushes, basically, is that home that is registered to Bad Boy Films, which is part of Bad Boy Entertainment. And the home in particular is registered not only to Bad Boy Films, but to one of P. Diddy's daughters. They are so there you go. There's going to be much more to uncover here. I'm calling it now. Should I also call now P. Diddy didn't kill himself? Should we go ahead and get that out of the way and just go ahead and say that <laughs> just for posterity on this on this issue? Because uh, things are lining up. The pattern is forming now, like in the wake of all this coming out and his house being raided, 50 Cent put this out 
he says this is gonna break records uh, when this drops and it's did he do it which apparently is gonna be an original docu-series that's coming soon how the hell did you already get to working on a docu-series which again just reinforces for me like people know this stuff's about to happen and there's just whispers circulating and people are waiting for it to sort of boil over the top of the pot, you know, and people have information that this stuff is going to happen long before it does. Um, and, and we're just left as, as the public to sort of receive this information and take it as it comes to us and take it uh, at face value, when in reality, it seems like this is something that many people, including law enforcement of the highest agencies in our in our country, have been aware of for quite some time and have simply done nothing about. And the amount of victims that probably exist in the wake of an operation of this magnitude is probably astronomical. And uh, you're probably never going to hear from all of them. And some of them might be some of the most famous people you've ever heard of. Uh, whether or not that will come to light or they will even feel comfortable or brave enough to speak about it, I don't know. But it seems like the river runs deep uh, with everything that P. Diddy was doing. And I feel weird even just attributing it all to him because they're clearly trying to paint a narrative to uh, to put him in this position. This sort of power does not just befall somebody. I believe P. Diddy opened up his first record label when he was 24 years old after like an internship or something, how the hell does a 24 year old just go and open up their own record label and who bestowed him with the power and the elitism to be able to do that? There's a much bigger system at play here with some names who are puppeteering way, way, way in the back behind the curtain. And P Diddy will be the front man who bears the brunt of all of the different allegations and the ring that now I exists here in in these lawsuits and in the investigation that is that is uh, hopefully being carried out right now, but it's not just P Diddy. It's not just no, P Diddy. We know it, and I hope to your to your point. I hope Cat Williams is right, and that uh, all of this is exposed in twenty twenty four. But you just get the feeling that this is part of this pattern that we've seen of, yes, there is this dark underbelly in the entertainment industry, in echelons of power like Wall Street. And then you you get glimpses of that through a particular person like Harvey Weinstein, like Dan Schneider, mm -hmm. like as in the case of the Nickelodeon documentary last week. And there's other tentacles to that, uh, as in Jeffrey Epstein as well. And, and it makes you wonder, like, yes, we see this person being uh, the fall person for what's going on. And of course they're implicated in some horrible things, but what about the people who enabled them? What about the people behind the scenes? So who knows how, uh, how deep the rabbit hole goes. Uh, so clearly there's, there's progress happening within the hip hop industry and something is going on to where this is all coming to light now. But the real question that remains is because I know little rod, uh, implicated the names of some other CEOs of uh, record labels and things like that. So you, you wonder if the, the arm of justice will reach them or if this is all going to be just kind of hung on Diddy's neck and he'll go down. But all of the uh, powerful interests that be behind the scenes are going to retain their position as they appear to have in the case of Epstein, kind of let him be the fall guy kill himself and then mm -hmm. you know what we haven't we still haven't gotten the list we still don't know any of the details about any other people who are implicated or involved so you just can't help but be cynical and think that you know we're not really going to get as much light as there should be in this case yep 100 percent. we will see who's next and see what happens but it kind of reminds me it's very similar to what happened in the wake of the nickelodeon documentary it's just kind of like okay i'm glad that this is being exposed and i'm glad that we can talk about it and i'm glad that we have some of the finer details here that we can share with people and, and talk about it but then you kind of listen to it and you're like duh like duh this stuff was going on we know we've heard whispers of it we've heard people who have tried to come out and shout from the rooftops about this stuff this sort of stuff happening uh, in, in the case of child stars and the abuse that they face, I mean, Drew Barrymore has sort of sounded the alarm on things that she endured as a child star, at the very least being plied with drugs and, and alcohol. You look to Corey Feldman, uh, Corey Haim, who've talked about their experience uh, within Hollywood. Corey Haim is unfortunately no longer with us, but he made allegations against Charlie Sheen and some very vivid uh, allegations that I implore you to look into. 
that man's not f fessed or, or faced uh, what he should face if these allegations are true. It's just ridiculous to some of the things that have been said. Corey Feldman recently, I believe, was confronted by a TMZ about the Nickelodeon documentary, whether or not he watched it. And he heard the name Brian Peck and said, duh, I've been trying to tell people about Brian Peck for how long? Everybody knew about Brian Peck. Everybody knew what he was doing uh, probably long before he had uh, assaulted Drake Bell. So it's it seems like a lot of this information is coming out at a time where it's comfortable to come out and at a time where the pieces have all sort of been set up to where we have the people who are going to take the majority of the fall for this and we don't have to worry about the broader implications of what's being stated in the lawsuits or what's being stated in the docu-series and we can sort of move on and everybody can pat themselves on the back and say oh yeah well we got Brian Peck or we got P. Diddy and not looking any further but I implore y'all look further just like Epstein we need the book we need the list we need the flight logs I bet there's flight logs with this one too. It might not be the Lolita Express, but it's it seems to lead toward the same the same path, the same uh, end point. So there's many more names to hear. Uh, and you guys drop your thoughts down below in in the chat. Anything else from you, Taylor, on P Diddy before we move on? <laughs> yeah, just one good, like philosophical note is that the pattern I'm seeing right is that uh, access to money power, sex, fame, has a tendency to corrupt people. And people who have been corrupted by those things uh, then have a tendency to want to use the position that they're in to corrupt other people that enter that space. So you look at like Harvey Weinstein, you can have this role if you submit to my power, if you, you can get all access to this money, wealth and fame, basically, if you sacrifice your integrity. I think that's what's so interesting. And what shines out to me about what Cat Williams said is like, I was offered $50 million multiple times uh, mm -hmm. in order to basically sell my soul and to keep quiet. And just the way that, that this works, like with Epstein, with what uh, with what P. Diddy now is being accused of, of filming people who gain access to these spaces um, and doing things that are indecent, doing things that are immoral. And then they he in houses that are rigged up with cameras, they get filmed, mm -hmm. they get blackmailed. And now you're you've become a slave to these corrupt interests that hold the keys to power and fame and what have you. And it's just interesting. It stands out to me that the bulwark against that is personal integrity. It's the it's not will, being willing to be bought, not being willing to engage in those activities. If you maintain your integrity, if you don't engage in those things that are immoral, if you don't take the bite of the, the apple of temptation, then those people cannot control you and cannot have any power over you. And those forces can't have uh, power over you. And you don't get roped in to that web of corruption and lies and degradation. And I just think that that if there's a lesson that we can all take from this other than yeah, we want justice. Yeah, we want to know who's behind uh, the, the curtain and who is really dr the driving force behind all this. But I see the pattern of just human propensity for evil and human propensity to be corrupted by these temptations. And we should all uh, just be reminded that it is a good thing to maintain your integrity and not to give in to temptations for a moment of pleasure uh, at the expense of your morals and your long term uh, integrity. So that's, I think, a lesson we could all maybe look at from this. Yeah, there's always going to be somebody who's willing to offer you something in exchange for something else. And you better make sure what you're giving off in exchange is not a piece of your your morality or your your values and that seemingly is the case in everything here mind you we're not even just talking about sex trafficking statutory rape we're talking about druggings we're talking about murders we're talking about lights out ending people's lives uh when it comes to p diddy there's a lot and so many very very well-known celebrities who are named uh in this uh meek mill j-lo uh cuban goody jr there's a a ton of people uh, that are, their names are scattered all throughout this. Not that I am accusing them of anything. Let me make that very clear just to say their names fall uh, in relationship, in some sort of relationship with P. Diddy. And if it's very well known that, you know, everybody knows what P. Diddy's up to. Everybody knows he's just that kind of, that kind of crazy guy. How many of them were familiar with all of this. Now we're going to move on to uh, New York City. All my New York City girls out there that are getting punched in the face. 
what? I like go on TikTok the other day. I'm scrolling through my for you page and I see uh, I see this girl and she's talking about, yo, I just got punched in the face in New York City. Let's listen. You guys, I was literally just walking and a man came up and punched me in the face. Oh my God, it hurts so bad. I can't even talk. Literally, I fell to the ground and now this giant goose egg is forming and I'm like, you guys. So this girl was just looking at her phone when somebody came up and just rocked her shit just hit her right in the face and look at that huge bump that she has so i see i see video number one i'm like okay that is really strange hope they catch the guy i noticed she didn't really give a description of the guy she could be you know in in shock i totally understand you don't really think if somebody uh, just comes and hits you in the face when you're looking at your phone which seemed to be the through line in many of these stories you'd just be like okay well Maybe she didn't get to see the the person who did it. We'll get to that in just a moment. I keep scrolling. I'm watching TikToks, whatever, and looking for stuff. I just see another. I see another video of a girl saying she just got punched in the face in New York City. Let's watch. Just got punched in the face walking home. I was literally like leaving class. I turned the corner and I was looking down and I was looking at my phone and like texting and then out of nowhere, this man just came up and hit me in the face. I'm like, okay, so she gets hit by the, in the face by somebody in New York City, just some random man. Again, they, this guy just keeps getting described as the man. And we don't know if this is the same person committing these acts over and over again, but I'm like, okay, that is super weird. At, at two, it starts to get weird. You guys know that question of like, how many owls would you have to see in one day for you to start thinking that's weird i'm seeing a lot of owls today how many girls getting punched in the face in new york city do you need to see before you start to think that's <laughs> that's really weird i'm starting to see i'm starting to see a trend here well i keep scrolling and then girl number three pops up on my for you page and she said i literally just got punched by some man on the sidewalk he goes sorry and then punches me in the head Holy fuck, what the hell just happened? Okay, so, uh, number three, number three. I, I, now I'm thinking, I, I'm supposed to go to New York and very soon actually, and I'm thinking, I don't want, <laughs> I don't think I want to go to New York anymore. These girls are getting, getting rocked right in the street. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. And then we have number four. So last week I was assaulted in New York City, as you can kind of see here with my black eye. If you know me, you know that this isn't really something I would typically publicly talk about, but I just feel like this is something that women need to be more aware of. Okay, so that's number four. I keep scrolling, I keep scrolling, I keep scrolling. I get five, I get six, I get seven, I get eight, I get nine, I get 10. We're racking up numbers as far as, as girls, and typically white girls for some reason, getting at, just just annihilated in the streets of, of New York. Now, in the four videos I just showed you, the girls just say, a man, this man, I got punched in the face by a man. I was on my phone and a man came up and hit me. They don't give a description of the man, which of course, typically we know what that means when you're not getting a description of the person who committed the assault you are kind of getting a description of the person who committed the assault now i don't want to say that's the case all the time but y'all know when when ann coulter went on uh bill maher's show and they said you know what's going on with these mass shootings and you know we don't know who the suspect is and she said we do know who the suspect is or at least we know what he what he looks like because if you're not hearing anything about what the suspect looks like you know what the suspect looks like and i totally get it right i don't think that's always the case but honestly in 2024 like nine times out of ten that that seems to be the case and if i'm a young white woman in new york city who's left-leaning or is in a place where typically people are left-leaning which we know new york city is that place maybe i don't want to be as forthcoming about the description of the person who hit me in the face because you know what happens at the very least on the internet when you do that i'm sure they all did it in their personal reports that they filed with police but when they come on to tiktok they're not being as forthcoming with the description and it's because if you say it was a black guy or a hispanic guy all of a sudden you know people start 
coming at your neck for uh, being a racist, a xenophobe, all these different things. So we can sort of read between the lines here. Again, we don't know if this is the same man committing all of these acts of hitting women in the face, although it is following a very similar storyline and a pattern. Most of these women, not all of them, are walking down the street by themselves and they're distracted by their phones. Again, not all of them. And then a man approaches them and uh, hits them in the face, sometimes tries to continue the assault against them or just gives them, you know, one punch in the face and goes about their business. Now, one of uh, these women did end up getting a, a guy arrested. So we'll see what happens here. I will show you this. This is from the New York Post. It says fringe political candidate who ran for New York City mayor accused of sucker punching a TikToker. The man who allegedly sucker punched a TikTok influencer in New York is a perennial down ballot political candidate who ran for mayor, governor and city council in the past three years. Skibaki Stora, 40, of uh, East New York was charged with assault Wednesday in connection with a random Monday attack on Hallie Kate. And that was the number one, the girl number one that we showed you with the blonde hair with the huge knot on her head. Uh, it says the NYPD said after the influencer told her 1.1 million followers about being punched in the face by a stranger as she walked the streets of Chelsea Monday. The suspect was set to appear in Manhattan court on Wednesday morning for a previous arrest, court dockets show. He is a frequent candidate for elected office in performing arts and, and a performing artist who records rap music under the name Designer Attitude. That is indeed a designer attitude to uh, walk around the street indiscriminately punching women in the face. So he's been arrested. And again, we don't know if this is the guy who committed the other assaults because in the wake of this, um, other women have come out and spoken about what happened to them. They have given a description of the person who did this to them. At least one woman did. I'm going to try to pull up the picture that she got of this guy. And uh, here is her picture of her assailant that punched her in the face. Now, this is a different looking guy to me. He's got dreads, the hair is is different, although he is also a black guy. Now, other girls described uh, a six foot something black man with dreads of about shoulder length, uh, and that was a shared description amongst a few of the women. But my goodness, what is going on that multiple men are committing this same kind of assault against people? Now, she says that this guy seemingly was unhoused, I think is uh, the terminology that they're using now, homeless guy, a homeless guy who is uh, going around and hitting people in the face. Some people were going and saying, this is some conspiracy amongst incels and they're like meeting each other on their message boards and talking about assaulting women. It doesn't strike me that these guys are incels. Uh, it strikes me that uh, they might have maybe mental illness going on or they just have, you know, malevolence for uh, toward women and white women, apparently in particular, and just want to punch them in the face. But my goodness, was my TikTok feed full of women being assaulted at rates I've never seen before. And what a weird thing to just walk up to somebody on the street and just hit them in the face as hard as you can. We've seen things like this happen before. And in New York City, there was the whole knockout challenge that was really popular. Uh, coincidentally, we shall say, um, amongst black teens that were going, they were going around and trying to knock people out on, on a first punch and pick a random stranger. They would get people in uh, chokeholds and try to choke them out on, on the street and get this on video and post it on the internet for clout. I don't know that this is a similar challenge or if this is just a, a man who wants, or a few men who apparently just want to assault as many women as possible. But what a strange thing that it's happening at the same time within the same few weeks. I'm, I thought to myself, OK, maybe this is just a common occurrence in New York. And now TikTok is just picking it up. And the algorithm is just promoting these videos as a sort of trend is building and people are becoming more aware. And this is just something that's happening in New York City. If you guys are in New York and have been there for a while, you let me know in the comments down below. But this, this is scary.
scary indeed. It's yeah, it's also reminiscent of I think it was a year or two ago we had a string of Asian citizens being assaulted on the streets of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was a recurring thing that that kept happening it seemed over and over again. So, this is there is a pattern and these random assaults are are deeply concerning. Uh, it's hard not to think about the sort of soft on crime policies that mm -hmm. a lot of these cities tend to have. Um, the, tragically, this past week, there was an officer in New York City that was killed in a traffic stop. I think his name was Jonathan Diller by uh, someone who had 20 prior arrests. Crazy. Um, and that's not an, you know, I mean, that is a maybe a unique case in that sense, but it's not an isolated event for repeat criminals to be out on the streets. I don't know about who actually perpetrated this punching in the face or whatever, but mm -hmm. we've also seen uh, New York City uh, being a haven for illegal immigrants. And I just saw a stat today that the illegal immigrants in New York City are going to be paid 40% uh, more in SNAP benefits or food stamps than uh, American citizens are. Um, and we, we know what happened in the case of Lake and Riley, et cetera. So it, it, you can't necessarily draw a straight line between these attacks in particular and some of those policies, uh, policies that are soft on homelessness in major cities. Um, but you know where there's where there's smoke, there's fire, as you can maybe uh, say with the the puff daddy and all the smoke around that. There's something going on, and I think it's it's fair to at least cons bring those into consideration, those policies into consideration, uh, when we're looking at patterns in cases like this. And it also just I hate to go there, but it does strike me as a little bit ironic. I don't know what the the voting preferences of these women are, but the the largest uh, cohort of for who votes for these policies of soft on crime in blue cities tends to be the single white women. We know they're the most liberal cohort. Again, I don't know about the politics of these women in particular. Right. If, even if they did vote for this, that doesn't mean they deserve to be punched. But there's something to be said for the fact that this is could be seen as uh, the reality of the things that you support, of policies that you support punching you in the face. And uh, I'm not, again, saying that they deserve it. I'm not saying that, that they, these women in particular, voted for this. But just kind of applying this lens to this whole situation, uh, these the blue cities need to get something under control with crime and with uh, the homelessness and with all of these things. And that much is evident, at least to me. I think this story can, I, makes me think of that one way or another, as much as I want to not attribute these things, you know, to broad uh, generalizations. Yeah. I can't help but have my mind go there. Dude, 100 percent. You look at these like major crimes that are being committed and the people who end up getting arrested and charged with them. And it's like they've been arrested 13 times, 20 times. You know, they've, they've been in jail X amount of times. Why are these people getting back out on the streets? And it's because they're being soft on crime. It's because they're saying, oh, well, we don't want to put people who look a certain way way behind bars because that makes us look a certain way. And quite frankly, it's ridiculous because it leads to more victimization like this. The very guy who punched the first girl in the face, Hallie in the face, was supposed to appear, appear in court on Wednesday for a previous arrest. So what is happening that not only is he being let out to commit further acts of criminality, but he's able to run for public office like this dude is running for public office multiple times and doing all this different weird stuff within the city. It doesn't make sense to me, I can tell you that. Um, funnily enough, uh, a lot of these soft on crime policies are largely because of an ideology known as DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we can actually trace it back to these sorts of woke ideas, the critical race theory, the restorative justice, and we can lay a certain level of blame on the people who espouse this ideology. But many conservatives are running with the uh, DEI slogan and attributing certain things to DEI that should not be attributed to DEI. And today we're going to talk about that Baltimore bridge that collapsed. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story out of NBC News, the Dolly cargo ship was cruising away from the port of Baltimore when its lights suddenly went out just after about 1.24 a.m. Tuesday. The Singaporean vessel, which stretches nearly a thousand feet long, had apparently lost power. It was now effectively rudderless and at the mercy of the currents. Four minutes later, 
The dolly crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, a 1.6 mile span crumpled into the harbor within seconds. Six construction workers who were filling potholes on the bridge remain missing. I believe there were also cars on the bridge at the time uh, that it was completely crumpled into the water. This is just a devastating occurrence, a crazy video. Uh, if you guys got the chance to see the actual ship itself hitting the bridge and it almost immediately collapsing, completely devastating. Now, in the wake of that, Baltimore's elected mayor uh, responded, and here is the video, and th this video for some reason went viral, and I will explain that reasoning in just a bit. Uh, everyone, this is a unthinkable a tragedy. Uh, we have to, uh, first and foremost, pray for all of those who are impacted, uh, those families, uh, pray for our first responders, and thank them, uh, all of them working together city, state, local, to make sure that we, uh, everyone did. Okay, so this video is viral, and uh, this guy tweets out, this is Baltimore's DEI mayor commenting on the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. It's going to get so, so much worse. Prepare accordingly. So let's go ahead and clear this up for any conservatives who might be attributing this to DEI. When you're elected mayor, it's because people voted for you. In his case, I think over 70% uh, of his constituents ended up voting for him to make him the mayor of Baltimore. So it's not exactly an action of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is an action of the people. Now, this video went viral because people were quite frankly making fun of him for being black and, and young, essentially, is what was happening. They were calling him a DEI hire, a DEI mayor. Uh, people were calling him out and saying he should have put on a, a suit jacket, which, interestingly enough, like the jacket that he's wearing says City of Baltimore, and it has his name engraved in it, and it says the mayor. It is an official jacket of the city, but apparently he should have put on a, a suit jacket for what uh, was a, a devastating occurrence. I mean, we can argue back and forth about uh, the, the look of that, whether or not that actually matters. Now, what he said was, in, in this moment of, of devastation, first we turn to prayer. I mean, as a non-religious person, that's not the choice that I would make in terms of phrasing, but that matters not. It was grammatically correct. There was nothing wrong with what he said. Now, then conservatives like uh, Elijah Schaefer post this on the internet, a picture of him saying, dat bridge be closed, yo. Even though in the clip that we all watched, he spoke in perfect English. <laughs> perfect English, no uh, no Ebonics or AAVE, American, African American vernacular English, if that's what we want to call it, doesn't really matter. Nothing there. Jack Poso posts, at least your grandchildren will know you fought racism with a photo of the collapsed bridge. Huh? <laughs> like, make it make sense. So now what you've done is You've taken what is very valid criticism of diversity, equity, and inclusion that is leading to real deal problems, real deal misallocation of real resources, real deal just issues that we are going to be facing for the, the rest of time in this country if we don't, you know, turn around and do something about it. And now you're making it into like a black issue and you're throwing the letters DEI at people that have nothing to do with DEI and are not in office because of DEI. And it just now you're giving left leaning people who already dislike conservatives, who already dislike our initiatives against DEI, and now they get to point to you and say, oh, you're just racist. You don't actually care about diversity, equity, inclusion. You are just going to attribute that to all black people of all time. And it is now a running joke on Twitter and other platforms that DEI is the new N-word. So that's just what we call uh, black people. Instead of calling them N-words, we call them DEI. Uh, and people, of course, are making jokes and saying, DEI, please, and all this different stuff now. And that's going to catch on because people are using DEI and blaming it where it doesn't make sense to blame DEI. This is why you got to use your noodle, roll it back a little bit, calm down before you start making these like brash statements that get you clicks in, in all this stuff and really utilize the criticism where it makes sense sense. I mean, here's a popular left-leaning account that tweeted out, DEI is now a racial slur. What have we learned? A word is less important than the intention behind it. As a result, white people will always find a, way, a new way to call us DEIs. Y'all fumbled the ball. Y'all fumbled the bag. You messed up the mission. You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. Hey, 
I basically agree with what that guy in the last tweet said, minus his last statement where he said white people will always do this. Now you're just sliding back into the pattern of generalizing all, you know, all an entire race and reducing uh, a people group to their skin color and then attributing certain intent to them. So in the same breath as you attributing this intent to uh, to all, all white people and calling out white people for doing that, you're doing the same thing. It's just so I agree with the first part of his statement, though, that when, you know, there's plenty of criticism that can be levied against DEI and the fact that it is uh, a form of discrimination. It is positive discrimination that necessarily uh, discriminates against Asians and whites in ac domains like academia and ev everywhere. Uh, you can just on principle alone say that this is wrong and it mm -hmm. rightly should be in the crosshairs of people who like the truth, of people who like equality, of people who are principled and moral. But whenever you uh, go beyond that, whenever you use the term DEI in a, to characterize all black people as not being qualified for things which the clear evidence of the fact that this man was elected to his position. Uh, so therefore, he deserves to be in that position by mm -hmm. virtue of, you know, democracy. Uh, that is why he's in that position. So if you're saying he's only there because of DEI, that's basically saying because he's black, he doesn't deserve what he has, which is a, essentially a racist thing to say. So uh, you don't have to <laughs> go to these go to these lengths. And uh, it just it's unnecessary. And you're seeding the moral high ground, the principle of the matter is no longer on your side when you go over your skis like this. The truth is no longer on your side uh, when you go over your skis like this. And what happens is the moderate people who you would otherwise be persuaded to your side of the argument uh, watch you behave in this way and then they are alienated from your position, which is the more rational position to be anti-DEI in my estimation. Yeah. Uh, but you undercut your own argument whenever you go out over your skis like this. And that's what's such a failing on this. And to, to their credit, some commentators like uh, I saw Chris Rufo and others have sort of said, we need a reckoning on the right with a lot of this stuff that's going on with the Christ is King conversation, with this type of stuff uh, where we need to, we're going to lose, basically. We're going to lose the culture. We're going to lose more ground than we already have uh, if we don't stop shooting ourselves in the foot with missteps like this. And I do agree with that estimate, with that sentiment. Yeah, y'all got to chill out. You know, and we we did sort of already predict this. I, I said, if you usher in DEI and affirmative action and all these different things, you're going to create a racist environment because what you're doing is reinforcing the idea that black people are getting things that they are not owed. And in many cases, that is true. I mean, we're doing it with scholarships. We're doing it with job opportunities and diversity quotas. And what it's going to create is an environment where whenever you see a person of color, you're going to think you don't deserve to be here because you're hearing about all the legs up they're getting. But you have to be able to apply nuance to the situation and say, well, if he's elected mayor, then he was elected by the people of, of Baltimore. And that is not an example that I can use to, you know, take DEI down a peg. It just doesn't work in that case. But this is what diversity equity and inclusion does. It makes every black person, every person of color, every woman look like they're in a position that they did not earn. And we're going to get more and more instances of this where whenever a person of color is seen doing something or a woman is seen doing something, they're going to uh, go on the internet and say that this person doesn't belong in the position they're in. I saw a black female pilot going viral on X the other day and people were saying she was like a diversity hire pilot and like, look how, look how she's flying the plane. First of all, she wasn't even an American pilot. She was like a European pilot and she was flying the, the plane perfectly fine. But now people are attributing it to DEI and uh, affirmative action because that is sort of the environment that we've set up. And that is the natural way in which somebody would view a situation when they know that people of color, women, indigenous people, whatever you whatever the case may be, are being treated differently. So get ready to see a whole lot more of this. And then the left is going to push back and say, well, well, DEI is now a slur and you're just using that as the new N-word. You're going to see a whole bunch more of that on uh, your social media timelines. So keep an eye out. And with that, y'all, we're going to get into your super chats. Let's hear from the audience today. All right. Kind of a lot, lot to unpack today. A lot of uh, <laughs> 
stories so to many uncover. conspiracy theories the p diddy conspiracy people are saying that the girls getting punched in new york is conspiring incels and then others are saying that this whole bridge collapsing is a conspiracy and it's all planned y'all i'm tired where's my tinfoil hat let's get <laughs> exactly. them on exactly i'm tired uh uh, Kwasi Kula is our first super chatter today. He says, uh, happy Wednesday. Amala, your X slash Twitter takes are on point. You're based on and <laughs> off the spot. Uh, anyways, I should try to be first more often in super chats. Hey, there we go. Battle for who's first in the super chats. Uh, yeah, I've been spending more time on X. I don't normally post on there, but uh, recently I've been sending out a little tweet or two. So if you guys catch them and you appreciate them, I appreciate you. <laughs> Uh, the engaged few says, I'll say it first, Diddy didn't Epstein himself. Yep, exactly. We got to start just laying the groundwork here for what is almost uh, inevitable given the, the nature of the accusations and the layers of the accusations and who they're against. But we shall see. Maybe he'll uh, maybe he'll get through this and maybe we will get a list, but I doubt it. Yeah, he didn't uh, Boeing whistleblower himself either. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Taylor Fan Club says, hello, my sweet prince, General Epinobi. There's literally a video of Justin Bieber snorting Coke Odell Beckham Jr. is holding while they're both standing next to Diddy, 100% guilty of something. Yeah, it feels really strange. You know, you watch all these people as they age and then you look back, given the, the nature of the allegations and see like, oh, things are starting to make sense. Like during that quiet on set documentary where you saw the clip of Brian Peck uh, rubbing the arm of Leonardo DiCaprio and you look at Leo now, who I believe just got a fresh new 19 year old girlfriend, uh, according to some news outlets, allegedly. When you look at that, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, if, if, if the picture that I'm painting in my head checks out, Everything that's happening right now makes sense. The like doing coke at the Super Bowl and like being uh, coked out of your brain all the time makes total sense. The young girlfriends makes total sense. And it starts to just line up. Usher being gay makes total sense, you know, Uh, because that is the natural progression of things when you endure trauma and abuse. Not to say that all gay people are traumatized. Let me go ahead and put that out there just in case that gets Media Matters go and clips it and says almost says mm. that gay people are sexually traumatized. I, I don't say that for, for all gay people, of course not, but I, many are. This is a fact. Yeah. Uh, Deportal 304 says, hey there, A&T. Girls like Kiki are real lucky I'm not president yet because they would be the first to get deported. LOL, 100% facts. Wow, you're going to deport Kiki Palmer. So she danced on a gay man, <laughs> I mean, allegedly. <laughs> and you you still have problems with that? Ah, uh, whatever. Uh, Kiki's going to uh, be fine. Kiki's going to be fine. We know that. And oh my God, it's a good thing she's away from Darius Jackson. He sounded horrific, horrible. Obviously, he got allegations of abusing her. And I think even uh, photos and video footage came out of that. So... She got herself out of a bad situation, I think, from dancing on on Usher. So if dancing on Usher gets you out of that situation, then I guess it's the lesser of two evils. Two wrongs made a right, I guess. Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, So much drama in people's lives to keep up with. I don't know how we do it. Dude. Uh, Dev says, first time super chat to say, did he did it? This corruption in elite circles needs to be exposed and brought to an end. Keep it in your pants. And as always, thank you, Amal and Taylor, for bringing the news. Yeah, thank you for listening. I am, again, so curious to see, because there's a lot when you really, we didn't even really peel back. all. The, I gave you the basic, basic view of what P. Diddy is being accused of and how uh, deep it runs. Think like what I just told you times 100 uh, and when it comes to the, the levels of the elite people involved in this and law enforcement and all this different stuff, we are literally just scratching the surface. So we'll see how far this goes. If Cat Williams is correct and 2024 is the year of exposure, we got a long way to go and only a few months left to do it. It's true. Yeah. On that note, I was listening to a podcast the other day um, from National Review. A guy, Charlie Cook, was talking and he was talking about how several uh House representatives of Republicans have said they are not going to run for re-election or they're like, you know, stepping away from their seats. Mm -hmm. And basically it's because uh, they are somewhat principled and 
see it as futile to be engaged in politics in that way because uh, it's so rife with corruption and special interests and all this stuff that they sincerely want to have a debate on the floor about policy on the merits. They sincerely mm -hmm. want to pass legislation that would accomplish good things for the country. But it is so such a you know, a quagmire, such a stagnant uh, cesspool of corruption that mm -hmm. they can't and they've become disillusioned, which sucks that if we're sending good, good people. people who would be re want to represent our interests but are unable to because of how much corruption there is in our political system, that's just, man, not a good sign. So it's not just in the entertainment mm -hmm. industry. Uh, who knows how deep the rabbit hole goes, but probably as deep as it possibly can go. Dude, it's literally everywhere. It's everywhere in the, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I won't even get into it. I'll say your politicians party too. Your politicians party too. Mm-hmm, mm mm-hmm. All right. Loretta Jean Moi says, this is exactly why I'm still a firm believer that Jay-Z and Diddy uh, being for that Jay-Z and Diddy being behind Tupac's death, just in case y'all needed a little tin hat theory. Oh, dude, there's a lot of people who feel very strongly that Diddy has to do with uh, quite a few uh, deaths, and uh, Tupac is no exception to that. Uh, I've seen many a conspiracy. We didn't get into all that because it's just a lot to unpack. But yeah, there's a lot of people who feel that way, and... Given what they're unearthing about the hip hop industry and how people are lined up and how they choose like the next big name and how they get rid of people. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Obviously, I can't speak or make an accusation against him, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, let's see. Greg Sockerman says, Amala, did you know that people stand you on Roblox? On Roblox? Like Roblox, Roblox the game? <laughs> yeah, I guess. No, I didn't know that. I did not know that that was a thing. I didn't even know you could stand people on Roblox. How does I don't know how Roblox works. So, oh, yeah. that's very cool. I, do you like build a building that spells your name or something? Yeah, no, I've literally never, <laughs> never been, uh, never tried Roblox. So it's to know no, that I'm reaching, I. reaching that corner of the the world, <laughs> it's pretty cool. We'll take it. Yeah. Um, Damon Blackfire says the FBI seldom raids a home of a trafficker to obtain evidence. It's almost always to destroy evidence implicating their paymasters in D.C. or their own field directors. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, like the history of raids or like how they work or like what is the mechanism behind, you know, why they would uh, do a raid. But I, I've, I've seen many uh, a person say that this is just to sort of get what we need to get and get the hell out of there type thing, uh, which... Again, I wouldn't be surprised. That's all I'm going to say. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Robert Slager says, I feel like they're trying to drive women out of New York to be more free with the violence in the state to do whatever Tehran's doing behind the scenes. Yeah, I don't know if it's that like coordinated. I feel like this is just like really malicious, probably mentally ill people who are have just been emboldened to commit crimes. It's the very same thing that we're seeing here in LA where you have career criminals who just go, oh, I don't care anymore. I probably won't get arrested because uh, the cops either can't do anything or are demoralized to the point where they won't do anything. And even if I do get arrested, I'll spend one day in jail. If that, I'll be out back on the street and I can commit another act and I probably won't get caught again. So it's just people who are bad people who are picking up on the pattern that's being laid out and picking up on the cue that, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead and do it. Nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna happen to you. I think the only reason something is really happening with these girls getting punched in the face is because it's going viral on TikTok, which uh, shows how powerful a tool social media is in getting something done here. They may or may not have caught this guy independent of it going viral on TikTok, but I can't imagine that uh, it going viral, you know, hurt the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, squeaky wheel getting the grease is very much a thing mm -hmm. in uh, policing as yep. well. Because there's resources that are limited, and but they'll apply them where they're getting a lot of bad PR or whatever it may be. Yep. Um, Visible48 says, Amala, I am former left and not religious. This would cause me to shut down any conversation from the right. How do you think religion affects the ability to reach left-leaning individuals? Uh it depends. Oh, I'm, I'm a non-religious person, so I don't think it affects my ability at all. Uh, I would imagine that 
a lot of left-leaning people who are secular, if you are secular, there's left-leaning people who happen to be religious as well, but uh, if you're left-leaning and secular, it's kind of hard to listen to somebody who's appealing to a higher power when it comes to their values and morals when trying to make an argument towards you. So I'd argue that it's not really effective ever to argue from the standpoint of religion to somebody who is non-religious. It's just something that I wouldn't recommend. And that's why when you see conversations between people who aren't religious and people who are, they never go anywhere because uh, you're, you're, one is appealing to uh, an authority that they like presuppose is the truth and the other is, is not. So it's kind of very difficult to, to get through to people, just on a fundamental level, and not that it speaks to the validity of your religion or anything like that. It's just to say it's not... It's not helpful to appeal to religion when trying to speak to somebody who isn't religious. Yeah, and as a religious person, I agree. It's important to not appeal to an authority that the other person doesn't recognize and one that you can't necessarily empirically prove. But yeah. you, you can look at outcomes. You can look at like the usefulness of your beliefs and history and across time and make an argument maybe from there. Uh, but even so, like you should be able to justify, if it's true, you should be able to justify it in terms that the other person can agree on. Yeah. Um, so stay in that world. And I think you'll, you'll have uh, more better, better results and better conversation for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacob L says, all I'm hearing is Amala for mayor. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm yeah, you'll never go see me in public office, y'all. I'll I'll be the one who gets I'll get cuz I'll 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 literally I'll show up to the first meeting, see all the corruption, and I'll be like, "Hey y'all, I got to tell y'all something." I'll be on TikTok the next day trying to tell y'all everything I saw and then they'll they'll off me. I'll be done. <laughs> I'll be done so quick. Uh, they'll be like, Amala, here's 50 million if you can do us this favor. And you'll be like, nah. And then they'll be like, all right, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to be wired up the whole time. That's the thing. I'm just going to mm -hmm. be, I'm going to wear a wire and I'll just, uh, I'll stream it all on Twitch or something for you guys to <laughs> hear. That would be interesting. Make your whole <laughs> life like a documentary about that you record secretly of like going into politics yeah. and then exposing everything that if I happens to you. That would be, be epic. That would be epic. But I would never be invited into the rooms that they are doing. Uh, I think such dealings. You, you, know you can play along. You're a good actress. You can do it. <laughs> sure. Uh, Damon Blackfire says trying to appear palatable to unhinged lunatics who want to destroy the United States is why the American right loses all the time. In Argentina, we learned that the hard way. Afuera zurdos. Mm, I mean, there, yeah, it depends on what, who you qualify as being like a lunatic. It just depends. I think there is, there is something to being palatable that is quite helpful, especially at the inflection point that we're in right now. And I think the right can take a lot of strong, super strong, staunch stances on issues that if you just like let up on the gas a little bit and allowed room for people to enter, you would see a lot of people changing their minds. I think the we're at a point right now where a lot of people are just sitting in the middle looking up and going like, I don't like either of these sides. And we're going to see that in this next election cycle 100%. Um, and if you just... We're a little calmer, a little smoother. If you just rizzed them up a little bit, <laughs> you'd have a lot of people who are willing to hear you out. 100%. Yeah. And then you can quickly become the unhinged lunatic whenever you start saying things like every black person who ever achieved anything is because of DEI in 2024. Right. It's like, okay, now yep. you're not calling out the unhinged lunatics. You've become that. So the key 100%. is to stick with principles, stick with truth. And that's the, the, keeps you from falling out of the ditch on on either end um and there's there will be disagreement even on on the road but uh, that's that's mm -hmm. okay as long as we're not beholden to the extremes on one side or the other mm -hmm. um deport all 304s again says says dei stands for didn't earn it those three letters explain why it's collapsing on itself in real time there better be massive lawsuits coming hashtag negative iq Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, you would. Yeah, I mean, the Civil Rights Act is sitting right there to be utilized in this, but uh, I don't think it's going to necessarily happen, at least not on large scale DEI. I think what we'll see is people start to recognize the issue and roll it back sort of silently <laughs> is what we're going to, uh, I think, end up having happen or it'll go to its full extent of just destroying things and then we'll sit in the in the ashes of what it 
created. But yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way, that it does sort of stand for didn't earn it. And that's why they're applying it so like on a, on a blanket level towards people of color and, and women and things like that. And it's a justified feeling. It's not a justified application. Well said. Um, Randa says, can you guys react to the middle ground of cheaters versus cheated on? I've been wanting to hear your opinions on the topics they spoke on. I was going to think, I was thinking, because I was like, I didn't know what we're going to do for Friday's show, and I want to do something, you know, a little bit more lax. We've been doing a lot of, like, Candace fired from Daily Wire, P. Diddy trafficking ring, you know, n n Nickelodeon sexual assault and all this stuff. Maybe we need to do something more chill. I don't know that getting cheated on is more chill, <laughs> but yeah. I did watch part of that middle ground, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. I should at some point watch this on the show and i think maybe maybe friday we'll do that squirtle power says my college just hired a whole group of people just because they're black they get paid each 80k each just to spy in different departments and report in fractions of inclusivity that is dei yes that is a hundred percent dei and you'd be rightful in calling that out and saying this is not yeah. okay hundred percent see this is yeah just as long as you have the right application by all means, call that out and, t and say why it's wrong. And, and we'll be here to, to support and, and defend that wholeheartedly. Yeah, 100%. Um, Ophela Espink says, the world is getting crazy. Thanks. Thank you both for bringing awareness to the issues we're facing this country. We try. Hopefully we're doing, uh, we're doing them justice. Oh, Loretta Jean MUA says, Taylor, it's MUA as in makeup artist. Makeup artist. Still love you, though. Yeah. I think I said MUA. MUA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, makeup artist. <laughs> I thought it was just like maybe the kissy noise or something. That's so funny. Yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. It's a good thing you didn't know that as a man, I guess. Deport <laughs> uh, All 304 says, Amala, what would be a few non-surface uh, non level red and green flags on a first date? Uh, oh, don't say submissive caring fun not selfish etc because the girl i'm seeing is already those things this the one from saturday non-surface level red or green flags okay i'm trying to think non-surface level it's like a whole video green flags yeah i don't know non-surface level green flags um i don't know just feel like good priority priorities like she prioritizes family and friends i think that's like a non-surface level thing that you can sort of suss out over time and through action because a lot of people will say I, I really care about my family and friends and then in action you don't see that so um they can give you a surface level answer but you have to wait for like the long-term proof that that is actually the case what other things can you look for I think just like reading the signs in watching not how they treat you, but how they treat other people. It's just so telling, uh, just being a little bit of a fly on the wall, stepping back and observing how they communicate with others, uh, how they communicate with service members and people who are, you know, doing acts of service for you is a really telling thing. Um, what else? How they talk about other people in their, their lives. Do they talk bad about their friends and family and, and things like that? It's all just observation in the long term, I don't know how else you can really figure out who a person is or what their values are, whether or not they stand by those values. If you're not with them for a long period of time and getting to see them in different different arenas, stressful situations. Also, not to actively force a stressful situation on the person you're dating, but <laughs> a good marker is to wait for like a stressful situation to befall you guys because it naturally will. That's life. And see how they deal with with hard times, because when you're dating, it's super great to be like, oh, there's green flags everywhere and everything's fine. But you have to wait for something for the shit to hit the fan a little bit and see how they handle that. 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, it's good to like be aware of red and green flags on a first date, but you can easily slip into like overanalyzing mm -hmm. and everything when it's just a first date. And the true red or the true red flags usually only emerge over time yep. as you live life, go through things with people, give them opportunities to show their character in different situations, etc. And that's where you're going to learn more about red flags. So the trick is kind of in the meantime if you're not getting any red flags to keep that antenna up a little bit and not let yourself get so carried away by infatuation or your emotions mm -hmm. or whatever, because you're just so happy to not be lonely and have a relationship that you overlook red flags that are actually glaring you in the face. So 100%. It's, it's good to be thinking about, but uh, also in the, and that to, in the meantime, just don't take it all too seriously and kind of just enjoy the, the, the early stages of dating. Cause it is fun. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, one more from, actually we have a few more here. Let's see, 
Uh, Sasha O'Neill says, been watching you for so long. Sa uh, people said my laugh changed only to realize I started to laugh like you. <laughs> You're an influencer on another level. <laughs> wow. I'm changing your guys' laughs, your mannerisms. I guess that's what they say. Like when you hang out with somebody for long enough, you start to adopt their, their mannerisms, their isms. So you guys are taking on my Amala isms. I'll have to hear your laugh one of these days. <laughs> See if, if we match up. That's kind of cool. And... That's a very strange influence to have on somebody's life, I have to admit. But I'll take it. It's a good one. Hey, as long as, <laughs> long as people aren't adopting the Kamala cackle. Yeah, good. exactly. The Amala, the Amala cackle is better than the Kamala cackle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Star0024 says, I ran for Congress last cycle. I ran against a guy that made public jokes about uh, sex with kids and was anti-2A. Trump endorsed him. Thanks for reporting on what is happening to the kids. Truth matters. Oh, wow. Very interesting. I wonder who that person would have been. That is, uh, yeah. I, I imagine like once you step into the realm of running for public office, you learn a lot very quickly and you see a lot of things very quickly. And then there's got to be some point where you're like, invited into the, the back room where, where things are actually actually going down. And uh, on that positive, uplifting note, that was our last super oh, no. chat for this <laughs> oh, day. Okay. Well, what an interesting place to uh, end out the show. We've had an interesting time today. I hope you guys uh, learned something or, or became informed. At the very least, we weren't talking about uh, all that positive uh, subject matter, P. Diddy and his sex trafficking ring that again involves so much more than just him. I want you to remember that. Girls getting punched in the face in New York City and a bridge collapsing and a DEI. So we got into a lot today. Let me know how you feel about the different subjects that we covered in today's show. Drop it in the comments down below after the stream. As always, if you disagree with anything I said, do get out in the comments, but do so respectfully. And if you like this video, like, subscribe. Click the notification bell to be notified every single time we're live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Plus, we post videos for you guys every single day. Tomorrow's video is a little bit of a lighter topic. We're talking cultural appropriation and braids after a white girl asked her TikTok audience, could she put box braids in her hair? Uh, she did not like the response. I could have warned her it was coming, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. And as always, I will see you on Friday for a live stream where we may or may not watch Jubilee's Cheaters versus cheated on and with that we have one last super chat here um from i don't know how to say your name lucia lucia kekik kekik i don't know how to say your last name i apologize close enough. <laughs> close enough close enough for government work first time catching the live you rock greetings from serbia thank you so oh. much i appreciate that and i'm glad that you're a first timer and a first time super chatter that's an amazing note to close out the show on guys thank you so much for watching have a fantastic rest of your day and peace out